food is not the only way that our body gets energy and information. We're not set to the sun anymore. People are eating at all the wrong time. Those three imbalances, I think, drive heart disease in general, but specifically heart attacks in younger people. UVA morning, UVA light, that's very important for triggering your body to burn fat. You don't have to spend that long in the gym to tell your body it wasn't good enough so that it rebuilds stronger. Very important to think of diet as the entire environment that your body is exposed to, not just what you physically put in your mouth and digest. Author of the amazing book, Understanding the Heart, health coach, heart attack survivor, helping people all over the world improve their heart health, our guest today on the Settle or Be Better podcast is Dr. Stephen Hassey, who's going to be talking to us about heart health and a lot more. So welcome, Dr. Stephen, and over to you. Why don't you begin by telling us a little bit about your work and how has it been so far? Yeah, so, um, yeah, I mean, my health journey, just like a lot of people's health journey started, you know, with my own uh, health issues as a child. Um, and so that really got me interested in health, obviously, because, you know, um, I was trying to be healthier. Um, but yeah, I had a lot of inflammatory conditions as a child. Um, everything from autoimmune disease to, you know, just uh, allergies to hives to asthma, all kinds of stuff. And, um, you know, my parents and I kind of were relying on Western medicine to help us figure those things out, help us manage those things. But I found it interesting that I was never told why I had those things or that there was ever any possibility of getting rid of them. And so, you know, you know, as I, as I grew up, I, um, started learning a lot more and lots of trial and error. And, you know, I'm happy to say that most of those chronic conditions, aside from autoimmune type one diabetes, um, that I was diagnosed with at nine, um, ha are gone and all of them are gone. So, um, so yeah, but have, being type one diabetic, I'm heavily predisposed to heart disease. So I spent a lot of time, um, trying to understand that disease, um, and, and, um, and what actually causes it because the narrative we've been told is, is not accurate. And so I spent a lot of time, you know, uh, gathering information about this and I realized I had a lot of it and I started sharing on social media and people seem to respond well with this information about the heart. And so I eventually wrote this book called understanding the heart about that. Uh, it's my second book and, um, and yeah, and things are going well and it just kind of all kind of fell into place. And, and now I'm just trying to help people by sharing information because there's a lot of misinformation out there and, and I want people to have all the information out there before they make decisions about their health. Absolutely. That's really good to know. And uh, definitely for the ones who are not following Dr. Steven, you can find the details in the description below. You should definitely go and uh, follow him and look at his content and if all the, stay updated with all the new information and probably bust the myths uh, around heart health and a lot more other things. Because uh, what you talk about really uh, clarifies so many uh, doubts or problems that, you know, uh, the confusion that is there out there when we talk about heart health. Uh, so that's really, it's really good to know. And, uh, it's really great to have you on a podcast today. Uh, if it's not a very sensitive subject, uh, could you touch a little bit about, you know, your, uh, heart attack and how, uh, how did it happen? What were the reasons that, you know, what did you notice, uh, the reasons behind it happening? For sure. Yeah. So, you know, to my shock and surprise, um, uh, when I was 34 years old, I had a widow maker heart attack. So. There is a clot formed um, in my in my left anterior descending artery and blocked it 100%. It was an acute clot situation, it just spontaneously formed. And, um, you know, I had a, a CAC score done uh, six months prior to that, and it was zero, which is, you know, a measurement of calcification of, of arteries. In mine, there was no calcification whatsoever. Uh, when they went in to place the, to dissolve the clot and, and place the stent, uh, they found no atherosclerosis anywhere. They just saw this big clot in my, in my artery. And so, you know, at first I was sitting there thinking about all the things that I talk about and I was like, man, I'm a hypocrite and, and I couldn't prevent it myself. And, but in reality, it was a wake up call to me. And then the three days I spent in the hospital recovering was a real wake up call because, you know, I was aware of, you know, the shortcomings of Western medicine. Um, but it was on full display right there in the hospital for me. And I started to realize that, you know, I was pretty well versed in all this information about heart health because of all the research I've done, but the average person wasn't, or wouldn't be if they were in that situation. And so I decided that, you know, I had to get this information out there. So 
people could make more informed decisions because the information I was getting from the doctors uh, and the nurses in the hospital was just very uninformed, um, I would say, not research based. Um, and so I, I wanted to, I, I need to clear up a lot of those things so people have all the information. But as far as why I think it happened, um, I mean, I'm, I'm very predisposed as a type one diabetic. Um, and so, you know, my blood sugars are never going to be as normal as someone who's non-diabetic. Um, and then, so, you know, that predisposed me to inflammation imbalance in the autonomic nervous system and, and things like that. But also I was under an extreme amount of stress at the time. Um, I'd been under a lot of stress prior to it. And then I got very stressful news about a close family member about a day and a half before it happened. Um, and so, so there's that. And then the other thing that I think ultimately triggered it, I mean, I was in that stress situation, that inflamed situation, um, was that I did a very intense workout that morning. So about 30 minutes before I had a heart attack, I did uh, a very intense workout. And in that inflamed state, I should have been smarter in that stress state. I should have been smarter and not done that. Um, you know, because there is evidence that an extreme workout at the wrong time can initiate clotting factors. Um, but also there's a lot of evidence that as a type one diabetic, I'm more prone to, um, I guess a poor response to, uh, an intense workout or intense exercise, um, than, than the average person, uh, which ramps up sympathetic, which can increase risk of clotting, which is, which is what happens. So, um, those are all factors I think that kind of, you know, the planets aligned and, you know, I had a heart attack. Um, and I was lucky to have survived, um, especially that significant of a heart attack, but I'm fully recovered now. Um, my, my heart tissue has, has healed, uh, which doesn't always happen. Um, and, and, um, my conduction signals from my heart are, are normal. My ejection fraction is normal. Um, all that kind of stuff is all normal. And I did very little, if any of what they recommended I do, uh, at the hospital. Um, you know, as far as medications, they prescribed me 11 different medications while I was there. And if I listened to the advice, I'd be on probably five at this point, um, saying that I would have to be on these the rest of my life. And I did not take that advice. I did my own, you know, heart health, heart healing kind of program. And I'm, like I said, a hundred percent recovered. Uh, everything is normal. Amazing. That's really good to see you healthy, happy, and, you know, sharing all the knowledge and experience that you have. And there's some great insight in, uh, you know, uh, learning about your journey because uh, heart health or you know uh, heart issues have always been a scare for everyone you know ever since we know but usually we've seen it happen in a lot more you know older population but what we've recently observed in the last couple of years or so is that you'd see like young really young and seemingly fit people having heart attacks and that's just a shock you know for even for the people who probably are not into working out at all and they don't really live the fittest lifestyle and they see the fittest people having uh, to go through this. Uh, what do you think is other underlying issues or what are we doing? What are we missing out uh, when we are approaching uh, a fit lifestyle and what gets left behind that leads us to, you know, um, a lot of healthy people, a lot of seemingly fit people go through heart attack or uh, heart issues of any sort. Yeah. So in my book, I talk about three different imbalances. I talk about, you know, poor metabolic health, which is, you could call insulin resistance. And at the extreme of it is type two diabetes. Um, but it really all starts with leptin resistance, uh, which is resistance to the, the, um, hormone that kind of signals your satiety that you're, that you're full and that's secreted from fat cells. That's where it all starts. Um, but yeah, there's that, and then there's inflammation and oxidative stress, and then there's imbalance in the auto autonomic nervous system. Uh, which is kind of imbalance in how our body deals with stress. It's not able to deal with stress well and return to normal. Um, and so that those, those three imbalances, I think, drive heart disease in general, um, but specifically heart attacks in younger people. There's a study uh, recently that came out that said that the traditional markers, the traditional risk factors for heart disease that Western medicine uses are not predicting heart attacks, um, meaning that they're present or they're not present and someone is still having a heart attack or younger people are still having a heart attack. And those, those risk factors that they listed were smoking, diabetes, high cholesterol and high blood pressure. And so those things, um, if people don't have them, you know, are still just as likely to have a heart attack. It seems that's what, that's what's happening now. And so I think the main culprits are, it's this, it's really this imbalance in the autonomic nervous system that's driving. Cause when you look at like an acute stress response, clotting factors go way up. 
Um, and so that could be clotting that happens on the lining of the artery that helps develop atherosclerosis, or it could be a clot that's big enough that totally blocks the artery, which is what happened in my case. And, um, and so things that are really driving this imbalance in our autonomic nervous system are, you know, just really it's, it's a lot of different things, but it's I mean, toxin exposure. Um, but also the wrong, just the wrong environment in general, like we're giving our body signals and it's in a threatening environment or an unfamiliar type of environment. And it's having a stress response all the time. Um, even if it's a low grade stress response. And what that does is it turns off the non-stress response and it almost becomes turned off so much that it's, it's almost ignored. And so typically we should have a stress response where our body will also send a non-stress signal to keep it balanced and keep things healthy and return to homeostasis. And if we're living in this environment where we're getting stress signals all the time, that can create a big problem um, because we turn down that non-stress signal. And so some of the big issues are, you know, maybe stored past trauma or unresolved past trauma. Um, other things are just a complete wrong light environment. So we're supposed to be set, you know, our, our body is supposed to be set to kind of the circadian rhythm that has to do with when we eat, when we exercise, uh, when we're exposed to light. And so artificial lights have totally thrown that off because, you know, we're not set to the sun anymore. People are eating at all the wrong times, um, just various things like that. Um, so we're, and think about it this way. Like if, if people ever woken up and for a second, they couldn't remember where they were or what day it was or something like that. It's a very stressful 10 seconds when you're trying to orient yourself and figure out, oh yeah, it's, it's Thursday, it's May, whatever. Um, you figure that out. Your mind can tell you that, but you got to think that if your body's never getting signals that tell it what time it is and what season it is and where it is on the earth, then it's always going to kind of be in this stress state. And so we have to give it the right light signals. We have to be in contact with the earth. We have to, you know, the, the sun is what tells us what season it is. And if you're not exposing your body, your eyes and your skin to those stimuli, then your body is confused about where it is. Um, if you're eating at all these random times, uh, it's not the same time every day. If you're eating too late at night, that gives your body the wrong signals of what time it is. And, and that's a very stressful situation for the body. It can lead or can drive this imbalance in the autonomic nervous system that is very heavily associated with cardiovascular disease and cardiovascular events in the research. Um, so those things are, are driving it for sure. I think there's a little bit of over-exercising um, in our culture. I mean, because it's it's one of those things that I think is also driven by Western medicine because it's not something that threatens Western medicine. And so it's like eat right and exercise. And those things are important, but people get this over-exercising mentality that you have to you know, run 5Ks and marathons and you have to do CrossFit where you know, you're just doing these super intense workouts. And... I just don't think that that's the healthiest thing for us. I'm not going to take that away from anybody if that's what they do and it gives them something, you know, or if it's their career, you know, and it gives them something. However, for the average person who's just trying to be healthy, it's not something that we need to do to be healthy. And quite frankly, I think it can be dangerous because it drives up inflammation and it drives imbalance in the autonomic nervous system or it can. Um, and there's, you know, lots of documentation that people who do very long, intense exercise throughout their life have more scarring of their heart. Um, they have a higher incidence of, of heart attack. Um, and that could be from various things. It could be from imbalance in the autonomic nervous system. It could be from not replacing electrolytes. So you're deficient in certain minerals and you're sweating a lot. So you're losing a lot of electrolytes. It's lots of different things that that could be. But, um, when I, when I think about what's driving this increased risk for heart attack in younger people, um, the, those are the things that I, I would focus on. Anders Ram, that's really a very interesting take on uh, the reasons behind it because I've, I've personally never heard anyone talk about all of these uh, different aspects. It's usually, uh, and one of the biggest misconceptions is eating uh, meat, or, you know, uh, that's how it's associated with heart health a lot of times. And that's, uh, that's like really normalized, uh, unfortunately, and uh, that's the misconception a lot of people have. Uh, now touching a little bit more on the workout aspect of it uh, because you just talked about it right now uh what would you say you know uh, how how does one know that it's the right amount of exercise for them for that particular day you know like how do we plan our workouts according to that and of course this can depend on the person's uh physical capabilities and a lot of other things uh, about themselves but 
if you were to put it in a nutshell and you know uh, just give a basic idea to our audience that how should we go about planning our workouts uh, in order to you know lead a healthy lifestyle and that doesn't affect our heart health uh, in the way that we might be doing it yeah um well generally i mean if you're talking about i mean i think the term cardio is a is a misnomer because it 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 um i guess it may, leads to us assuming that doing some type of aerobic or endurance exercise is good for our hearts. We're working our hearts. And I don't think that's the case. I don't think it is good for our hearts, um, or at least in, in long or, or large, large amounts of it. Yeah. You know, so any more than two, three miles of some said aerobic exercise, whether it's cycling or running or whatever it may be, um, I don't think it's necessary. Um, yeah, those are, it's, it, it, there's clear benefits to doing some aerobic exercise. But it doesn't have to be these long amounts. It could be very short amounts. You could even do more like sprinting, you know, uh, that type of thing would be more beneficial, uh, I think. Um, but generally, you want to maintain muscle mass, which is, you know, resistance exercise. Uh, so I think that's more important to do, especially as we age. I mean, maintenance of muscle mass is the number one indicator that we're going to live a long time. Um, and as we age, we, you know, our muscles do start to decrease in strength and size. So maintaining that, uh, is very important. So that's getting enough animal protein and resistance exercise. Um, and then, you know, I think some kind of lengthening exercise is, is smart. Uh, there's, you know, the research is a little bit conflicted on whether how beneficial that is to it, but I think that from a perspective of joint health and mobility, strengthening or lengthening, uh, the muscles is a good idea and keeping the joints moving. Um, but as far as like, uh, you know, you don't really don't have to spend that much time in the gym. There's, there's a few books, um, one called body by science, and there's a few other, you know, strength and conditioning people out there that are starting to realize that, um, you don't have to spend that long in the gym to tell your body it wasn't good enough so that we build stronger, you know? So, uh, you can do like, you know, I, I can be in there for like 10, 15 minutes and get a really good, you know, workout as far as strength goes. You just take it, you do like you know, one set to failure. Um, and you've told your body it wasn't good enough and it will rebuild stronger. And then you do that again with a little more weight next time. And, you know, you just keep working and, and getting stronger that way. Um, so you really don't have to spend that much time doing it, uh, which I think is important and um, to, to realize that people spend hours and hours in the gym where they go on runs that are miles and miles long. And I just don't think it's necessary for health. And Quite frankly, it, I'm not going to say that it's like inherently super dangerous because obviously people are doing these types of things all the time and they're not dropping dead, but it can happen. And there is evidence that it predisposes us to more disease later in life if we do that a lot. So, um, so yeah, and the other aspect of it is, is that if you look at people who are, you know, running all the time or doing these endurance exercises, they, all, they, they have all these injuries, you know, their body starts to break down. I have people in my life that I know that are just obsessed with exercise and they have hip replacements and knee replacements and they've separated their shoulders and there's all these different things that have happened because they're trying to go too hard. And I mean, if that's something they get, like I said, if it gives them something like some kind of mental health or it's just makes them happy, that's, that's fine. They just got to know the risk. And for people who are just trying to get healthy, just need to understand that you don't have to go so hard and work out so long just to get healthy. Absolutely. And that's very well explained. I'm sure that over exercising is one of the major aspects that, uh, you know, it's really, uh, it goes unnoticed and uh, people really don't consider it as a part of, uh, you know, the things that they need to consider uh, in terms of the heart health. And that's what we've seen in a lot of these uh, people, young people who have had heart attacks recently. Uh, and that's a good way to, you know, schedule our workouts and also to check in with your body. I think it's also it's very intuitive that, you uh, we know when to push our boundaries and when not to. So uh, that's something that we should definitely keep in our mind. And that really answers uh, the misconceptions around exercise and heart health. So thank you for explaining that so well. Uh, moving on to the misconceptions or the myths, particularly in terms of nutrition and lifestyle, if you can just talk about it in two aspects, you know, what are the misconceptions you you want to bust today about uh, nutrition and heart health and also lifestyle and your heart health, like anything that surrounds, uh, that's in our environment, it's in our house or, or that we apply on our skin, anything of that sort. Yeah. Um, well, the nutrition one's a big one because everybody says, or, you know, it's like conventional wisdom almost that, that cholesterol and saturated fat cause heart disease. And that is just not the case. It has never been proven to be the case. Uh, so I find it interesting that, you know, people like me and, and, and many others are fighting so hard to, to provide evidence against that myth 
when there was really no evidence for that myth in the first place. Um, it's just interesting. And so, you know, the whole idea that cholesterol and saturated fat cause heart disease uh, or the driver of heart disease came from some very bad science done in the 1950s by a guy named Ansel Keys, uh, where he basically just did associational studies, which can't prove causation whatsoever. They just showed that two things were associated with each other. Um, and it's the lowest form of research on the, on the hierarchy of research. It's the lowest form for a reason because you can't really draw concrete, concrete conclusions from it. And so, however, the idea, the theory got picked up, um, pretty heavily by pharmaceutical industry, which had a drug that could lower cholesterol and the food industry, like the sugar and the cereal grain industry, like they put a lot of money behind this theory because they can convince people that saturated fat was bad and animal foods were bad then people would eat more whole grains. And if you look at, you know, the bottom of lots of the, um, the food pyramid guides for the last however long, it's been grains at the bottom. Um, but all those things are funded by the food industry, all those recommendations and all those studies, you know, so it has really led us astray um, in, uh, in, our, com in our, our, I guess, our journey to combat health issues and disease. And so, um, so yeah, but the idea that, cholesterol in the blood ever decides to go into an artery like it's just evil thing that says okay i'm just going to go deposit myself in the line of the artery because that's what i do like that just doesn't make any sense whatsoever and the idea that the idea that um any one molecule in a complex biological ecosystem can drive a disease is also very short-sighted it's not how physiology works it's very reductionist uh and narrow-minded and it doesn't take into account the system as a whole. And so, but the other issue is that when you look at studies that are analyzed, what atherosclerosis or hardening of the arteries is made up of, there's no, there's very little cholesterol present. There's some there, but there's very little. It's mostly clotting tissue. Um, so it's what happens when damage happens to the lining of the artery and then a clot forms to try and repair it because the repair mechanisms the body would usually have aren't in place. Um, and that's, you know, poor metabolic health and insulin resistance and things like that. And so, um, so yeah, so it's the clotting issue that we need to talk or to focus on. And so that's more of a issue with inflammation and oxidative stress and, and psychological stress, like I was talking about, but this whole cholesterol saturated fat thing, um, you know, doesn't make sense. And there's, there's a lot of, a lot of evidence that our approach to lowering cholesterol is not working. It's not preventing heart disease. And that's very relevant because heart disease continues to rise can, despite the fact that cholesterol lowering medications are like the number one or number two drug prescribed every year. So lots of people are taking them, but heart disease continues to rise. Also, there are plenty of studies that show that these are associational studies so that you can't draw concrete conclusions from them, but they're studies that show that higher cholesterol does not cause heart disease and that higher cholesterol is associated with um, living longer and having less heart disease, less cancer, less infection, higher cognitive ability. So, you know, if we have associational studies that show that stuff, but also associational studies that show that it, um, cholesterol causes heart disease, then you, you realize that these studies can't be relied on. And they're really supposed to be used to, you know, you know, draw um, ideas and, and develop ideas and then test them clinically, but that oftentimes doesn't happen. Um, and so, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it doesn't really make sense nutritionally. And so, you know, animal foods, I think are the best foods for humans. It's the most um, nutrient dense bioavailable um, source of, of food, but segueing into environment and what you put your body in, um, you know, food is not the only way that our body gets energy and information, not at all. And so we've kind of been obsessed with this biochemistry side of things where everybody talks about the different macros and, and cellular health and what are you burning, fat or carbohydrates. And those are important things to talk about. But the, the energy you get from the stored bonds of food are not the only way that we get energy. We also get energy from light. Um, we also get energy from direct contact with the earth. Um, we get energy from moving our body. Um, we get, um, we get energy in a lot of different ways. And so paying attention to putting your body in that, that right environment where it can soak up energy from the environment is critical because if you're trying to give your body all the energy it needs from food alone, um, that's a, that's an issue. Um, because, because then you're going to overeat, you're going to try and get more calories. 
trying to get more energy when in reality you just need to get it from your your environment um and so um that's getting out in the sun as often as you can um and the sun does not cause skin cancer um and putting your feet directly on the earth and sinking your body to the different uh light times of the day you know and seeing morning light and mid-morning light and and noon and, and all the all the different light um that you can um and just putting your body in those types of environments that's going to put energy into your body. It's going to energize the water in your body. Um, it's going to, um, it's going to set your circadian rhythm so that your autonomic nervous system is more balanced. It's literally the most probably ignored aspect of health and, um, and heart health uh, out there is, is the right environment like that. The other thing to think about in the environment is the wrong types of light, not just getting adequate adequate exposure to the right types of light, but the wrong types of light, the wrong time, you know, so the artificial blue lights that we have. Um, I mean, there's no time when blue light would ever be admitted on its own. And so lots of these bulbs we have um, are just straight blue light um, or just a higher percentage blue light, not a straight blue light. There's other, there's other color temperatures there, but, um, but, um, but yeah, so, you know, minimizing that blue light at night and, and just keeping low light at night or getting blue blocking glasses or just using candles or things like that. I mean, these people may think this is all extreme, but it really plays a role into our health. And then the last aspect of environment that can drive this inflammation and oxidative stress and um, imbalance in the autonomic nervous system is the electromagnetic environment that we're in. You know, talking about all the electronics we use. Um, all the wireless signals uh, from cell phones and Wi-Fi and different, all different types of those things. We're literally surrounded by them these days, especially if you live in a city. Um, and so those things have an effect on our health, despite what people say. Uh, there's lots of scientific evidence that they definitely influence our body and affect our bodies in, in negative ways. Uh, they give us all kinds of things and, and they allow humans to do lots of different things to be productive and that kind of stuff. We just have to use them in a way that's that's smart and just be conscious of how they may affect our physiology so that uh, we can mitigate that if we if we need to. Absolutely. That's really some great uh, insight on this whole aspect and definitely simplifies uh, some actionables for audience in terms of nutrition and lifestyle or the environment that uh, they are in right now to make some small changes. And these are really not uh, that big of a deal, you know, like uh, someone would think that, okay, I need to take care of my heart health or if I want to prevent, uh, you know, heart issues, I need to do like some really big major changes in my life. But these are really not uh, that major. And, you know, if you think about it, you can actually start including a lot of these uh, very easily from day one uh, with baby steps. So that's really uh, interesting to know. I want to touch on two things here. So uh, one is a light exposure. Like what is uh, the right time for us to get that light exposure when we go out in the sun and you know um, like how, how much time is the ideal time and what uh, time is uh, not appropriate for it like are we risking ourselves our skin uh, in terms of that you know so that and also coal exposure because i've seen you talk about coal exposure a lot and uh definitely it's really growing popular and uh there are so many several benefits about it but uh very few are in terms of uh the heart health or you know in in this particular aspect so if you can just touch upon these two things for us yeah so you know the when it comes to light the I mean, the most ideal thing would be to wake up with the sun, get sunlight, uh, get that early morning light on your skin and your eyes as soon as you can um, and then see light throughout the day. I mean, the most ideal thing would be be outside all day. That's where humans were, um, you know, before we had indoors. Uh, and so so that would be the most ideal. I realize that's not realistic for a lot of people in, these, in this day and age, um, but you know, there's always something you can do. And lots of times, like with clients I have, I have to start with, okay, you have to block blue light at night then. When the sun goes down, you've got to reduce the amount of light you're exposed to because it's totally messing up your signaling, your hormones, your melatonin, everything, uh, your sleep, which is very important. Um, so let's, let's start with that. Let's get some different light bulbs in your house that don't admit the blue light. Let's get um, blue blocking glasses uh, at night. Let's just use lower light. Uh, and put the light lower down, like use lamps rather than overhead lights, just different things like that at night. Let's change that environment um, for them and work from there. And then, you know, ideally you're getting all the different types of light because it's, you know, it's the, the, the um, in the morning light, it's red and infrared. And those are really, really important, you know, 
wavelengths of light to get. And then UVA starts to come around in morning and then, um, then UVB and they're all there, you know, and then, and then as the sun goes down, it's, the UVB goes away and then it's UVA again and it's back to red and infrared. And so getting all those different, uh, wavelengths of light, um, and, um, uh, and different color temperatures as well, um, are important, you know, all those different things signal different things in your body. Just so just for example, like UVA morning, UVA light, um, you know, that kind of mid morning light. Um, that's very important for triggering your body to burn fat. Um, it literally takes, you know, palm seed, which is this thing that you know, develops into our brain. And then it, it takes it, turns it into, um, beta lipotropin. And that tells your body to burn fat. Like it's very important for metabolic health. So we talk about metabolic health and what we eat, but the type of light is very important too. That tells you, it gives your body signals to actually do that. So you can eat all the fat you want, but if you're not getting the right light exposure, then you're not going to burn that as efficiently as you should be. Um, so, so the ideal is obviously being outside all day, but even if all you can do is like every, you know, every so often you go out for five minutes and you just be out in the sun, um, then that's super important. If you just take a break and go outside, um, and do that. Um, but you know, if, if all you can do is, is block the blue light at night and reduce the light at night, that's, that's important as well. And then cold exposure, um, think about it like, Cause some people are just like, oh, that's crazy. Why would, why would I do that? Well, how can that be beneficial for health? Like, what's the point? And you got to think about it physiologically. There were times when we were cold, uh, especially in the winter, we got cold, right? And so it makes sense that you got to think of it like, it's almost as if we've created this environment that's too easy for our bodies, you know? And so that, that lack of, um, that lack of stress or hermetic stress has created the situation where the body doesn't have to work hard to be healthy because we're trying to pamper it too much. And so it's almost like the, it's a mentality of do hard things to create resilience. You know, just like if you, you know, do a workout, you're doing something, a hard thing to so your body's stronger. Right. Um, and so it's the same kind of idea there, except we're just using cold exposure. Um, and so cold exposure, you know, it, it definitely recruits the use of brown fat in your body, which is very good for creating a healthy metabolism. And so, you know, there's a reason that there these that the risk factors for heart disease are cardiometabolic risk factors because the metabolism and healthy metabolism is super important when it comes to heart disease. And so, cold exposure is one way that we can we can um, uh, increase the use of brown fat and create metabolic health. Um, it also helps with um, the you know the shrinking, as the shade of the electron transport chain in our mitochondria. So, for making energy, that biochemical process of passing electrons down. Um, those complexes, uh, is very important and, um, and cold exposure really helps that happen efficiently. And then the other thing is, is that, so when we talk about the autonomic nervous system and how our body handles stress, think about if we have imbalance in the autonomic nervous system, that means that your body can't handle a stress. And instead of, instead of adapting to the stress and then returning back to normal, it has a stress response that's harmful to you. And so if we can do small stresses, things that aren't acute, um, massive stresses, if we can do small stresses that train us to be able to deal with the stress and then return to normal, that's just increasing our balance in the autonomic nervous system. So that's what we see with cold exposure. We see that it helps create balance in the autonomic nervous system. It increases parasympathetic activity um, and helps us deal with more sympathetic, sympathetic responses. We see increases in heart rate variability, which is the measure of, of um, good stress response. Um, and so that's, those are the benefits of cold exposure, but it made sense evolutionarily because there were times when we would have been cold, especially in the winter. So, um, so yeah. Understood. And that's very true. Like we do lead extremely comfortable lifestyles today. And, you know, we have stopped exposing ourselves to the very uh, natural uh, weather changes or temperature changes, any of those things uh, that used to happen earlier. And, uh, you know, we've sort of uh, put clothes on, put blankets on and, you know, come in this small, uh, comfortable shell of us. And we definitely need to get back and get into touch with that aspect of our forgotten lifestyle. So that was a really interesting take on that. Um, also, Talking about your recovery, so this this is for the people listening who might have just gone through a heart attack or some issue and are recovering right now from that. Uh, was there a difference between what the doctors told you that uh, your recovery would be like and some things that you need to do versus what you actually you know started implementing and was the recovery faster using any of those methods? 
Well, I can only speak for myself and what I directly experienced because, you know, I was, I still am, you know, young and fit um, and generally healthy. And so I had this heart attack. And so um, my recovery was already probably had a better chance because of that. You know, if someone is 65 and really had poor health before their heart attack, um, recovery is going to be harder for them. Um, however, the things that I did, I think are very important and they helped me recover. Um, and when I went to the cardiologist and, and fully recovered, they were amazed. Um, you know, three months after the heart attack, my heart was fully recovered. So, so yeah, you know, they told me that I need to be on a statin drug, a cholesterol lowering drug the rest of my life. And all they did was harp on cholesterol and say, that's what caused the heart attack and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, I know the research doesn't suggest that whatsoever. And so I didn't take, you know, a statin drug, uh, did not take the cholesterol lowering medication. And none of this is medical advice. People should talk to the doctors, but um, this is just what I did. And they wanted me on um, blood pressure medications, um, two different ones. And they told me that that was to um, lower my blood pressure so that it would take strain off my heart. So there was less chance of developing heart failure because if there's heart tissue damage, um, you are more predisposed to develop heart failure. Um, and however, I knew that infrared light uh, on the body, infrared light exposure uh, is incredibly useful for not only the treatment of heart failure. And the research on this is very, very in depth or very, um, uh, there's a lot of it, I should say. Um, and so infrared light exposure is ways that is one way we can treat heart failure, but also, you know, if I'm trying to prevent it from developing in the first place would be a very good idea. So that's what I did. I used an infrared sauna um, pretty almost every day, I think that first six months uh, in recovery. Um, and they also wanted me uh, to take, um, let's see, the statin, the blood pressure medications, uh, well, two different blood pressure medications, one, the beta blocker, the other, the ACE inhibitor. Um, and, and they wanted me to do, um, they wanted me to eat a, uh, a low fat, um, low salt diet. And, uh, we've already talked about how the low fat thing does not create heart, uh, heart disease, but there's actually a lot of evidence that the heart prefers fatty acids and ketones for fuel. So they were asking me to, you know, take away my heart's preferred fuel source. Um, but also the low salt thing, um, there's this incorrect idea that higher salt intake leads to higher blood pressure and higher rates of, um, heart failure, fluid retention, which is a problem in heart failure. So they were wanting me to, to prevent that. However, I talk about research in my book that shows that if you give, if you give subjects higher salt, that, that, that actually creates less fluid retention. Um, so I'm not sure where that idea comes from. Um, but yeah, I did not follow that recommended diet. I mean, the diet they recommended in the hospital was terrible, not just what they gave me in the hospital, but what they recommended I eat afterwards. It was like processed food, vegetable oils, uh, low fat, low salt. It was just, it was a really terrible, um, diet. Um, and so, so yeah, um, I did those things. I also took, you know, a few different supplements that I thought were going to help, um, heal the lining of my arteries, um, break down any you know, scar tissue or clotting tissue that I wanted to break down, things like that. And, um, but yeah, you know, it was, I, the only thing I took was a blood thinner because there was a stint in my body. Um, and I didn't know how my body would react to that. Although I did find studies that magnesium, um, like intravenous magnesium is at least in animals effective for preventing clots after stent placement. Um, doesn't mean that's what people should do. I'm just saying that there is studies that magnesium is just as effective as a blood thinner. Um, but, um, I took the blood thinner for about six months and then I stopped doing that and they recommended I take a baby aspirin the rest of my life. Um, I have, I have not done that, um, just because of risk of other things. And I'm not saying this is what everybody should do, whether that's what's right for everybody, but I'm just saying there are other options. And if your physicians or your care team is, is not interested in those options, you need to find a different care team and, you know, work with them to find what's right for you, given this information. Um, but, um, but yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I did something radically different and I, it seems like to me, I got a radically different, um, result because when I came in three months later and I was completely recovered, they were, they were a little shocked. Amazing.
amazing that's very true and definitely our listeners should not take this as the only or the medical advice uh, they should definitely uh, you know consult with their own doctors and of course it might not really work with every single person at any age you really have to figure that out also with your doctors uh, but that was some great insight and of course apart from the supplementing or uh, the medication aspects some other things like the lifestyle changes you mentioned i don't think it would really hurt to uh, you know include them in our lives uh, of course if they are accessible to you they affordable to you you can definitely do all of these things and uh, even if you are at a seemingly healthy uh, place in your life right now i think a lot of th- these things uh, we can definitely start including uh, from right now instead of waiting for the moment that there's no other option and we have to go for uh, you know all of these uh, other medications and all of these things so that was really a great yeah. insight thank you for sharing that with us uh, lastly to put it in a nutshell what would you say uh, is a heart healthy diet um one that gets you adequate nutrients and um and also creates metabolic health um and so diet is there's lots of different diets that could give you metabolic health there's a reason that people um go from a standard american diet to a whole foods vegan diet and see lots of benefit because they went from a, a processed food, terrible diet to a more whole foods diet and they see benefit long term. I think that's going to provide a lot of nutrient deficiencies and they're going to have issues long term, uh, not enough protein and things like that. Um, but there's lots of different diets that could create metabolic health. Um, I think, you know, humans are animals. And so we mainly use animal fats um, to to drive our body. We can use plant fats if we need to in a pinch, if we're eating a bunch of those, uh, but it's not ideal. And there are studies that I talk about in the book that show that plant fats are not ideal. Um, but, um, but yeah, animal fats are incredibly important enough animal protein because it's really hard to get protein from plants. There may be some protein present, but it's hard for us to digest it in a way that actually creates access to that protein. And so animal protein is more bioavailable to us. So that's very important. Um, but just nutrients in, from a nutrient perspective in general, animal foods are higher, especially organ meats. Um, but also the muscle meat, um, you know, raw dairy, eggs, things like that. Really, really good. Doesn't mean you can't have plants. Um, but it means that we should be, we should be focusing on a diet that gives us adequate nutrients, creates metabolic health, and then doesn't do us damage because there are certain foods that, you know, depending on the person can create a lot of issues. Um, and there's this whole conversation about plant toxins, um, you know, now, and that's important thing to pay attention to. It's not going to affect everybody. It's not what, um, it's not that they're, um, they're causing poor health in everybody. Um, there's always going to be other factors, but they can are major contributors and they, they cause a lot of issues in people. And that's something we got to pay attention to. But the other aspect of what a healthy diet is, is that it's not just food. It's also light. It's also your relationships, um, uh, and your, your, your emotion, um, it, and emotions and things like that and, and your contact with the earth, but also the timing of it, you know, so it's when you eat, it just is almost maybe not, maybe more important than what you eat. Um, and so there's been studies in mice and in humans that show that they ate the same foods and the same amount of calories, um, like all day long, or they ate them in an eight to 12 hour window with, with it being earlier in the morning, you know, eating first thing in the morning and noon and then not eating later at night. They ate the same food, same amount of calories, and their health was drastically better measured and physically and just, you know, um, observationally much better. Um, So I think that it's still important to pay attention to what you eat as well. However, timing of it is very important too. Don't eat all day long, you know, get your get your calories uh, and your and your nutrients in a, a shorter window in the day uh, and then don't eat the rest of the day. And that could be, you know, 70% of the battle for some people. Um, but it's just very important to think of diet as the entire environment that your body is exposed to, not just what you physically put in your mouth and digest, but um, emotional environment and light environment and electromagnetic environment, all these different things that can be considered the human diet that either create health or create disease, depending on which one they are. 
absolutely that was really well explained and i'm sure that does simplifies a lot of these doubts for our audience and uh, this is a great insight for them um, in terms of their nutrition and also definitely our surroundings environment and our lifestyle in general which does play a major role and uh, we don't always have to uh, you know rely on medications towards the end if we start making these changes right now from right now in our lifestyle you know so that's really uh, good to know also lastly i just remembered uh you talk about a very interesting thing in terms of heart health strategies is focusing on oral health because that's something i've never heard anyone talk about uh how does that relate and uh how should we go about that yeah so there's a whole chapter in my book about the health of your mouth and how that relates to disease in general but especially heart disease um so yeah there's lots of toxic things that or some of them are toxic. Some of them are just um, uh, not health creating uh, practices in dentistry. Um, and so, I mean, the healthier mouth in general, if you're eating a poor diet or you're not getting the right nutrients, you can have poor dental health, whether it's, you know, receding gums or periodontitis and, or gum disease, um, things like that. Um, those are not good. But then lots of times the practices to, to fix a cavity, like, They've been putting mercury in people's mouths for a long time. Or if teeth teeth are pulled, they don't, they're not cleaned out properly. Or if someone gets a root canal, which in my opinion is something we should really never do. Um, uh, those types of things can cause lots of issues uh, for our health in general, especially heart disease. And the reason is, is that, you know, heavy metal exposure like mercury and cadmium, and arsenic, different things like that are heavily linked to um, higher rates of oxidative stress and inflammation, which is the driver of atherosclerosis, um, damage to the lining of the arteries. And so if you're putting mercury directly in your mouth, that's not a good idea. So you want to find someone who can help you remove those safely and put in something that's less toxic, ideally ceramic or something like that. Um, but also if you get teeth pulled and the socket's not cleaned out well enough, uh, they don't use ozonated water and scrape out the periodontoid ligament, um, then that can leave an infection in the jaw and your body can't feel the infection because there's no nerve anymore. You pulled the tooth out. Uh, you can't fight it off because there's no blood supply there anymore because you pull the blood supply out because the tooth is out. And so it just continues to kind of get an infection there. And that, that bacteria, um, and that infection, um, is gram negative and it leaks into the bloodstream and the body tries to kill that bacteria. And when it does, it releases endotoxins. So this is called endotoxemia and um, you can get endotoxemia too from leaky gut or poor gut health, but um, root canals and pulled teeth are also another source um, of endotoxemia. And there's plenty of evidence that increased endo endotoxins um, um, uh, contribute to the damage to the lining of the artery. And so you really got to find a, a dentist that knows what they're doing and knows the dangers of those things, which can be hard to find. Um, it can help you mitigate some of those things. Uh, the health of our mouth is incredibly important to the health of our entire body. Amazing. That is really something I haven't heard about before in terms of uh, its correlation with our heart health. And uh, that was an interesting insight for the audience uh, to think about because this is something that happens uh, on a very regular basis. I mean, we go for these treatments or, you know, we get these fillings uh, and it's very common, actually, you know, more than you think. Uh, and if we, even I've seen my parents also, you know, go and uh, take uh, have these treatments and uh, go through this dental healthcare. But uh, it's definitely a great new insight to consider. And when you're actually uh, going for these treatments, to look at your options and also to uh, see if you want to consult with any other dentist. So that's a really good thing to know. Thank you for sharing that with us. This concludes the episode for today. It was very insightful and uh, definitely some things that uh, not many people know about or have heard before and uh, we should all uh, get your book Understanding the Heart so I think that's going to simplify a lot of other things for us and uh, it's going to help us majorly so thank you for sharing that and being with us here today uh, as we conclude is there any last message any last thought that you'd like to leave us with um, I think that the most important thing for people to understand um and get to a point where they can they can see this is that you have to be your own health advocate. Um, there are a lot. There's lots of information out there. There's lots of advice out there, um, and all these most of them most of this advice is coming from people who have some kind of vested interest or just don't have all the information. Even if it's not financially driven, 
Uh, they just don't have all the information and they're truly telling you what they think is best, but what they think is best is, best is just uninformed. Um, and so you really have to be your own health advocate, which is why I'm trying to put information out there that can just help people make better informed decisions, because that's what it's about. You have to, you have to stay informed and you have to make the decision that's right for you. And don't just blindly trust someone's advice, even mine, even after listening to this, like if, if I said something that you like, great. If I said something you don't like, prove me wrong, prove yourself wrong, do the, do the research and do what's right for you, but just stay informed. Amazing. That was a lovely message. Thank you for sharing that. And it's absolutely true. And also a thing that, you know, a lot of people can think about uh, is that whenever you get any sort of a medical advice, uh, it's really not the end of it. If it's sort of a negative news for you, you can always find ways. You can always think about more things to do and also more uh, practitioners to reach out to uh, to find better options. So uh, that's what biohacking is all about. That's what, you know, we need to be informed about and to know options. So that was a great message. And I'm sure it's going to help a lot of our listeners. Uh, thank you once again, Dr. Stephen, for being here today. And for the ones who'd like to reach out to Dr. Stephen, you can find the details in the description below and a link to his book as well awesome yeah thanks for having me <laughs> thank you so much that's it for today's episode i am sakshi pavar and i'll be your host for the settle or be better podcast stay tuned while we bring more inspiring stories you know the drill subscribe to the settle or be better podcast like share and comment on our videos and do hit the bell icon because you don't want to miss the mind-boggling health discussions we're about to bring for you why settle when you can be better.